Hi, Steve here, blessedhopeforever.com. Total depravity, or you're not as sweet a person as you think you are. I think it's pretty safe to assume that the tremendous optimism which characterized the period immediately prior to the fall has pretty much disappeared almost entirely. Man is no longer seen as perfectible. Despair has overtaken the innocence of those days and sin has come to be recognized as a depressing fact of life. The depravity of man is no longer questioned except by a few careless spirits whose dreams for society are about as unrealistic as it is possible to imagine. Nevertheless, we still have among us a few ministers of the gospel who have high expectations for the uh, supposed innate goodness of man, but, but the enlightened Christian is wiser than this. So I want to talk a little bit about this. Uh, we're kind of going over, we're going back to the beginning because I didn't know what I wanted to talk about on this Wednesday. The doctrines of original sin, uh, the depravity of man, appear to me to be vastly nearer the truth than the popular illusions that babies are all born good and we can all become perfect over time. Sin, dearly beloved, is one of the saddest but also one of the most common predicaments of human life. We all share that common experience and so, you know, it forces itself upon the attention of all those who do not desperately close their eyes to the realities of human life. Now, there's plenty of those people around. Some may, for a time, dream of the essential goodness of man, but as time goes on and all attempts at reform fail, such persons are inevitably disillusioned. They become conscious of the fact that they have been merely uh, they've merely been fighting the symptoms of some deep-seated disease and that they are confronted not merely with the problem of sins, that is, of, of, of separate uh, sinful deeds, but with the much greater and the deeper problem of sin, uh, of an evil that is inherent in our human nature. This is exactly what we are really beginning to witness in great lengths at the present time. You know, it needs only one kind of circumstance to bring this deeply rooted malady in human nature to the surface. That circumstance is the acquisition of power over others. Most men have very little power over others, which is absolute. You know, we all have some power, but it, it's, it, it is so circumscribed and hedged about by social restraints of one kind or another, law enforcement, uh, whatever, that very few have the opportunity to learn what would happen to themselves if these restraints were suddenly removed, which is really what's going to happen at the rapture. But recent history has, has without a doubt, demonstrated what people are capable what, what they're truly capable of in their treatment of their fellow man when they're given absolute power to do with them what they will. You know, people who seemed uh, cultured, restrained, law-abiding, and, and considerate of others have been converted into to monsters to the surprise of the civilized world and perhaps to their own surprise if the truth were known. The Nazis... Uh, 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 Nazi concentration camps were often ran by people who spent their spare time listening to classical music or surrounding themselves with great works of art. If not doing the art itself, like Hitler did. But any disappointment that they may have felt in themselves seems to have been short-lived as they took increasing delight in the infliction of pain and injury upon others. Perhaps one of the most profound evidences of the sinlessness and, and incorruptibility of our Lord Jesus Christ lies in the fact that although His power was absolute, 
he remained absolutely uncorrupted by it. You know, he had power over life. He, he cursed the fig tree and it died, Matthew 21, and he had power over death. You know, he called Lazarus forth from the grave, John chapter 11. He had power to heal every conceivable kind of sickness. And he had power over men who would have taken him and, and murdered him because of their hatred. He merely walked untouched through their midst to John chapter 8. He had authority that, that he had that, that something which seems to be essentially rooted in the morality of man which enabled him to challenge the evil institutions of his day. You know, like when he cleansed the temple and no man lifted a hand against him. He had, he had power to forgive sins and he had power to condemn. He had moral, physical, social, and intellectual authority over men such as never been observed in any single individual before or since that time. He towered above mankind, and he still does. This, this is not literary fiction. You know, you can't invent a figure like that. Yet, he remained totally uncorrupted. The absolute power which elevated him to the very heights of heaven degrades fallen man to the very depths of hell. I don't mind issuing this warning to those who attempt to understand human history while ignoring the effects of the fall. It, the problem is, folks, we don't take sin serious enough. What history does is uncover man's total depravity. You know, while we create this alternate view of ourselves, which the study of history doesn't support, it is the restraints of culture that prevent human nature from showing itself as it really is or, or at least prevent some men from appearing as bad as they really are. You know, other men are not so prevented and increasingly more and more people are showing their true colors as the restraints of, of society break down. This is what we're seeing really like more than probably you would admit that you've ever seen in your lifetime. If we had no rules of the road, folks, the nasty side of human nature would appear more often than it does at the moment. You know, human nature needs only opportunity to declare itself for what it is. So it is widely agreed among most theologians, anyway, anyhow, that, that man is depraved, but just how much is depraved, is he? Totally, or, or only ver just very seriously. I mean, was human nature merely injured by the fall, as, as Roman Catholic theologians would say, or, or is he completely ruined, as the Reformers would say? You're watching a Reformed channel here, so you know what I believe. Has this fatal injury been communicated to every individual by inheritance, or does each individual kind of start out with a, a clean slate, you know, as Pelagius argued, has human nature been severely corrupted, but not so severely that the grace of God can't cooperate with that some spark of human goodness that still remains within us, which hasn't quite died, as Arminians believe? Or is man hopelessly, totally, completely depraved? You know, his nature so corrupted through the fall that the whole motivation of his life is evil, being self-centered and rebellious against God. Is man truly a total moral catastrophe? I suggest he is. <laughs> Spiritually dead, utterly ruined, his will free only to sin, his understanding darkened, his heart a heart of stone. Now, if that's true, and I believe it is, then what about all the evidence in history of human kindness, and restraint, and mercy, and, and self-sacrifice, and nobility, and, 
and so on and so forth. And what of human creativity, just plain old-fashioned common decency? What about that, Steve? What about, you know, surely we can't be all that bad. Well, Isaiah 1, 5 and 6 tells us that the whole head is sick, the whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there's no soundness in it. Jeremiah 17.9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Paul said, There's none that does good, no, not one. Romans 3.12 I think our problem is, is we don't believe what's written. We don't believe God's Word. What, ex what exactly did the fall do to human nature? Well, it corrupted it entirely. The Lord Himself spoke of those who, being evil, they know how to give good gifts. Matthew chapter 7. There is nothing, folks, nothing incompatible between the total depravity of man and man's ability to express common goodness or decency. God gives common grace. It's not saving grace. It's common grace. The, the ability of man to do good deeds in no way challenges his, man's basic depravity, total depravity. There's a huge difference between man being able to do good and man not being able to be good. You know, in spite of the fall, man has tremendous creative capacities. I was a, a fairly decent artist before I became a Christian. Some of you know, you know my vocation before that. But some of the most creative individuals have also been some of the most wicked, immoral, selfish, and cruel individuals known to history. Some of the most notably successful and sought after evangelists and, and conference speakers and, and Christian pastors and leaders have been, sorry, but they've been pers personally, they've been the, the most proud, unforgiving, self centered individuals imaginable. It is sometimes better not to know too well those from whom one receives the greatest help and inspiration along the way. What a man can do under God's inspiration and what he can be under his own are, are, are very different things. Man's instincts, if he has any at all beyond swallowing, are fundamentally suicidal in nature. No other creature is persistently so destructive of his own well-being. And if not for the common grace of God, then folks, man's life would be unbearable and his suicidal tendencies would probably lead to the total destruction of the human race. You know, to enter the kingdom of God, a man must be reborn, John 3, verse 3, and adopted back into it, Galatians Chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. But meanwhile, His common grace generates in the world that which is beautiful and, and that which contributes to man's well-being. Dearly beloved, should it surprise us that God in, in, inspires even the wickedest of men to create things of great beauty according to His own plan and, and as an expression of of His common grace, just as He reaches down to even the chiefest of sinners like Paul and redeems them, turning them into saints as an expression of His true grace, His special grace, His saving grace. So that surprises. You know, common grace acts generally in the world. Special grace is at work only in the elect. And total depravity and election, divine election, go hand in hand. If man is totally depraved and the world is a remarkably good place to live in, why does the community of the redeemed fail so miserably? 
I mean, I, this is an important question for a proper understanding of what God does with His people. We are accustomed to thinking that the first thing that He undertakes to do with us is to eliminate or, or at least to restrain the evil that is in our nature. You know, what is sometimes referred to as the old man, the old nature. You've heard me talk about it. Not realizing that He crucified it. He has nothing to do with it. It's a grave mistake to think that when God makes us a new creation in Christ, He begins to remove all of the evil from the, you know, from the old, clean up the old man and the, and the good that is rooted in the old nature, that He begins to clean up the old man. The natural goodness of man is not the promise of a new life, folks, but it's the remnant of a dying Adam. By the providence of God, man's natural capacities can be used for the general welfare of society. We see that every day. We see it around us everywhere we look. Used for the general welfare of society, but only on a horizontal and a temporal plane. The new creation does not operate on that level. The world may seem to do better on a horizontal plane than does the church of God which must operate on a, a, a different principle, operates in a different realm. This is what total depravity really means. Not total inability, but total spiritual inability. And sometimes we need, need to go back to the beginning if we're not understanding things in the present. It, it often happens that a man who has a, a certain natural ability and is filled with high uh, ideals and is known for his good works, you know, he will, when he's converted, become for a short while a far less admirable and effective individual. This form of natural good, goodness is, has to be replaced by a supernatural goodness. It's the work of God, it's the work of grace to convert natural goodness, which is counterfeit in the sight of God, into supernatural goodness that is genuine because the motivation has been freed from the bondage of sin and, and brought into conformity to the will of God, which is what we're told to, to, to be brought. Romans chapter 6. Common grace deals with man's doings. Special grace concerns his being. It is quite possible in the judgment for a man to claim truthfully, Lord, Lord, in your name, have I, have I not done many wonderful works? Matthew chapter 7, you're all familiar with the verse. The claim is not unjustified because it has reference only to deeds themselves and nothing more. You know, the judge can say with equal truth, depart from me, ye who work iniquity. Because a deed, no matter how good it is in itself, is really a work of iniquity when the motivation behind it is wrong. Dearly beloved, works done before the grace of Christ and the inspiration of, of the Holy Spirit are not pleasant to God because they do not spring forth from faith in Jesus Christ. You know, it, it sounds extraordinary, I know, that the good deeds of mankind or society as a whole spring forth from the nature of sin, yet there is no doubt that they do. It is not the deeds themselves, but motives that count. You know, a person may outwardly have the appearance of a, of a beautiful marble building spotlessly clean, yet the building on the outside may be only a whitewashed tomb full of dead men's bones. Painted white on the outside, Matthew 23. While inside is a rotting spiritual corpse. This is a saddening truth. The spiritual depravity of man, folks, is total. The totality has reference to his motive, not to his works. By eating 
a forbidden fruit Adam and Eve introduced into their bodies, some kind of poison. I have no idea what that poison was, but it destroyed their original perfection and as well as their immortality. And this was brought about purposely. I've, I've always suggested God put man in the garden to sin. Purposely done in such a way that physical death became the lot of mankind. We call it, we call it natural death, but... Folks, it was not natural at first. By their disobedience, Adam and Eve did not merely shorten their lives, but they introduced death as an entirely new experience. As Romans 5.12 says, by one man, that's Adam, sin entered into the world, and by sin death, and death passed upon all men. All men. You're not, none of you are accepted, Okay. We know that all men have inherited this disease, not only because all men die, but, but also because all men become sinners. You know, here's something that society just never ta ta seems to talk about. I, it puzzles me, I, you know. Sin is passed from generation to generation. An, an innate corruptness from the very womb, all of us descending from an impure seed, and we come into the world totally depraved. Man, if we, get, if we were just talking about that, but we're not. You know, man's first act of disobedience introduced not only physical death to himself and his descendants, but also spiritual death so that all men naturally born of Adam's seed have since that time turned the innocence of infancy into the sinfulness of adolescence and and then on to manhood and beyond, you know, aged, you know, the golden years. Romans 8.3, Paul speaks of what the law could not do and that it was weak, ineffective, that is ineffective without sufficient force on account of the flesh. This, he says, is why the law is so impotent in regulating conduct. Conduct. You cannot legislate morality, folks. It is not that the spirit is unwilling, but rather that the flesh is weak. Matthew 26. The law sets the standard which, we, which all of us are called upon to meet. Problem is, we can't meet it. And so many Christians think that we can or we should. That is not true. So we have to begin on the basis of total depravity which shows us the need for God's grace. Uh, and a proper understanding of that, of, of God's grace. You know, we don't really want to believe God's grace is what saves us, fo folks, but it is. The law is not the problem. The flesh is the problem. We are the problem. Because the eager desire of the flesh must, must have its own way. About all we can say on the basis of, of what is written in Scripture is that the time at which a, a child first discovers that there is a difference between right and wrong does not mean the child has inherited some inclination toward good in the spiritual sense. But it's common grace. He's just functioning in that area of common grace. And, and before that discovery, I believe all children go to heaven. I've done videos on that. I base it on the Word of God. Uh, two verses that I can think of right you know, off the top of my head. John 1.29 Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the elect. No, the sin of the world. That's universal atonement. Okay? I just destroyed myself as being a five-point Calvinist. It only becomes limited atonement on the basis of, of the grace of God and divine election. In Romans 7, 9, For I was alive, Paul says, without, apart from the law once. Well, how did he become alive? Well, through that atonement. But when the commandment came, law came, sin revived and I died. Okay? So because of original sin, the fall, our body inherits a disease, if you want to call it that. And in due course, this disease acting from within. It in infects the created spirit by imposing upon it temptations to disobedience 
to which it ultimately yields. Some yield very early in life, some a little later, but all, all yield in the end, except our Lord Jesus who didn't have this disease within Him. Because although he, he was tempted, His temptations always came to Him from the outside, not the inside. He said, the prince of this world comes and has nothing in me, John 14, 30. Both the first and the last Adam were alike in this. You know, that the first temptation came to them entirely from outside, unlike ourselves. And in Him is no sin, 1 John 3, 5. Man's nature is wholly corrupted from the very beginning of his individual existence and, and is under just condemnation. But we are in Christ under no condemnation, Romans 8, 1. In Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2, the sin there is in the singular. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin singular sin nature which doth so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that's set before us looking unto Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. That verse, those, that passage connects right to Romans 6, 11, first command given, reckon yourselves dead to sin, but alive unto God. Only the transforming experience of spiritual rebirth amounting to a recreation of the image of God in the heart of the, of the individual can fundamentally change this motivation and consciously bring it into conformity with the will of God. Dearly beloved, rest in Him. Until next time, Thanks for watching.